She is a lecturer at the uh, Berkeley Law School. She's also the co-founder of a strategic and policy consulting group, and she served as a senior White House and U.S. Department of Labor official. Um, she's also with the Program and Policy Development Director with the Law School, Chief Justice Earl Warren Institute of Law and Public Policy. <laughs> Lots of social hats. Lots of hats. And I, I just have to laugh about Maria having to get her cup of coffee because she used to have an office across from mine, and she'd come back from Pete's with two cups of coffee. <laughs> <the day. laughs> well, uh, so it's still good morning. And um, the title of this talk is Immigration and Labor, an Uneasy Relationship. Um, and what I want to do, I want to make sure that I, I leave plenty of time for questions. So I figure speak until about, I'm good until 12.30, right? So yeah. speak until about 12. But um, if you have a question about something that's not clear, you know, let's, let's make this interactive. Um, what I want to do in order to to, obviously, immigration debate is happening right now. Uh, the Senate just voted yesterday to, uh, uh, they voted cloture, means they had more than 60 votes to continue to debate, uh, to close debate and then move forward to actually voting on the Senate bill on immigration. Um, so it's very timely, but I think in order to understand what is being discussed right now, we really need to look back about these issues. And, and I'm particularly interested in the connection between immigration policy and labor and our economic growth. Because so often, the debate you hear about is, why do we need more people? They're taking American jobs. So I want to do a very quick uh, history of immigration. Um, the first thing to know is that other than uh, the Native Americans, the first Americans, everyone has come from someplace else, whether willingly or unwillingly. And one of the trends, if you will, or one of the uh, key themes about immigration policy it has been helping using our immigration policy to help define who gets to be an American. Um, Professor Bill Long Hing has written a book called that, Defining America Through Immigration Policy, which is um, a paperback, but it has a really good, uh, well-written, uh, with lots of footnotes. So if you don't want to read the, the cases, but he's citing all the way in which immigration policy has really been a battle about who gets to be part of us. And what I fault Professor Ong Hing's book on is that it focus to, focuses almost exclusively on identity and race and doesn't speak as much about the labor influences, like the fact that we were seeking or we opened our doors for others to come. Um, so the, the big waves of immigration obviously were both uh, the, the Northeast in the initial settlements, but also, as many people have mostly don't forget, is that there was Southwest, the, the coming of people through, from Mexico and Spain and settling in, in, in Santa Fe, and, um, as well as Florida. Uh, so that they're, they're sort of those initial. And then we had the first uh, sort of big effort to bring in labor to deal with a specific economic issue, which was building the transcontinental rail railroad, Chinese, Chinese, so some Asian immigration. Then we had the Irish potato famines, which led to a huge number of Irish coming to this country. I always say to my immigration class, the thing about immigration policy is we have this national myth that we are a nation of immigrants, as if we were welcoming <laughs> to every group. And what I want to stress is there's no group has been welcomed. Didn't anybody see gangs of New York? Uh, <laughs> Truly, no group has been welcomed. So each successive wave um, is challenging 
what the next wave, whether they're good enough to be American, but also concerns about work and jobs and, and economic growth. Um, so you have the big battles uh, uh, with the great wave from Eastern and Southern Europe. And, and uh, Professor Leo Chavez, who's down at UC Irvine, has done a very extensive study of comparing the, the caricatures and cartoons and images uh, during that wave of immigration. And they look very similar to the current negative, uh, you know, xenophobic. So there is this, con you know, I think it proves that no group was ever welcomed with open arms. Uh, but what's interesting about the debate uh, of immigration, on immigration, is that the 1920 um, laws, 1924, that set up the national origin quotas, which really uh, put a stop, if you will, to immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe, because what it used as basically said, X number of people com can come from various parts of the world especially from Eastern and Southern Europe, based upon the percentage of the American population whose country is of that origin, whose country of origin are those, based on the 1890 census. So it really, it, it clearly was a xenophobic, OK, we're putting a stop to this. We're going back to 1890 before this big influx of Eastern European Jews and the Southern Italians, all those Italians, um, Greeks, to the 1890 census. Now, that debate over the national origin quotas, one of the key voices was Samuel Gompers otherwise known as a tremendous forward-thinking labor leader, right? So s step back a little bit and what, why? Why would he be such a voice? Well, it is, it reveals what since 1920 has been the last 100 years, this uneasy relationship between um, organized labor in particular, trying to develop uh, middle class jobs and increased unionization, increased collective bargaining, and the <coughs> reality of uh, it, um, industrial uh, employers seeking other sources of labor. So I'll get back to that in a second, but I just, the 1924 law really revealed that support between labor and the xenophobic parts of Congress to slow down immigration. Then the 1965 law <coughs> was, uh, is really the framework we operate under. If you don't mind, I'm going to take that back. Um, and in part, President Kennedy, oops, President, President Kennedy, um, remember, remember, you might recall or have read about the early 1960s, there was this moment of uh, the civil rights laws. The national origin quotas was like this very uh, blatant example of racist attitudes on the part of the United States. And so uh, there was a real effort, look, we, we, we're, it's the 1960s. We have to change that. So the framework was uh, established. Uh, that is a family-based system and focuses on unifying families and creates a, 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 a cap, a quota of X number, hundreds of thousands, that's about 500,000 currently, worldwide visas. Uh, allocated per country, uh, with priority given to um, spouses of U.S. Uh, spouses of uh, legal permanent residents, children of legal permanent residents, adult children of U.S. citizens. Uh, their their categories 
first category, second, third. Um, if you if you are a U.S. citizen and you have a spouse, you, that doesn't count. But it, but if you have adult children um, over um, 21, then they don't automatically. All right, they're not automatically allowed. Then we have the category of legal permanent residents, their spouses and their children. And there's the division between minor children and adult children. Uh, the fourth category is brothers and sisters. And in addition to the family category, there is a provision for entry as legal permanent residents on an employer based, on an employment need. And that is um, less than 200,000. <coughs> there's a very extensive process. I'm happy to go into that in a, uh, in a bit. But what I want you to take away from this is that our, that our current immigration policy at law favors family without regard to employment needs. Meaning that uh, the people who come to this country who are seeking to work, the avenues for them to come here legally to work are limited. Right? And that, that's an important point to make because so often in our current discussions and the heated rhetoric is that, well, why are why aren't they coming legally? <coughs> As if there were these avenues. And they're not. They're family. And by the again, those are capped per country. And the other thing that happened in 1965 was that it was the first time that the Western Hemisphere was limited. There were caps put on the number of people who could come <laughs> legally to join their family from places like Mexico and Central America. So from, the fir from 1965, before that, it was a much more fluid. There weren't caps. Um, what had happened within a decade was the uh, backup, if you will, buildup of demand and waiting lists in order to come here legally. So it can be up to 10 years for the spouse of a legal permanent resident from Mexico to be able to come. That's the spouse. If you're a brother or sister, it can be 20 or more than 20 years from the Philippines or India or China. So this pent up <coughs> demand to come in. So OK, that's kind of the framework from a pretty open, then the national origin quotas, and then uh, the 1965 law. Now let's look at the, what was going on economically. And yes, ma'am? Can I just ask, were those quotas in effect from the 1920s until 1965? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, is there any connection? I, I remember my great uncle, my, his sister, my great aunt, was trying to get him over here after 65 and from Mexico and her trouble was the laws in Mexico and the paperwork in Mexico and uh, is there some kind of how does that connect to our policy here and Mexico's policy allowing their citizens to come to Mexico is there some kind of connection not really not really they the it's really Every country, I mean, there are folks, especially in Berkeley, who are always talking about open borders. And I always want to push back a little bit. I mean, for, you know, we're all as utopian and optimistic that we'd want to be, but we have nations. And one of the first things that a nation does is determine sort of what its physical boundaries are and what, how it treats its citizens within those boundaries, and then who gets to come in, right? And interestingly enough, when we were first established as a country, there were efforts. The early immigration, you know, laws were, you know, no paupers. Uh, if you, I mean, 
no mentally disabled. I mean, if a country could pick and choose who it wants to come, right, it would not want undesirables, right? So it, at my, one of my favorite um, uh, examples of, of, of this, who gets to come in, is even before Virginia was, before there was a United States, the Commonwealth of Virginia had a law that said, if you come, if you are a, you cannot come to the Commonwealth of Virginia if you are a Quaker. If you come the first time, you'll be imprisoned. And second time, imprisoned and a fine. Third time, death. Okay? So, so the people were pretty serious about who gets to come in, right? So then the challenges with the passage of time and with, with increasing civilization, <laughs> What are those rules? What are the appropriate rules? Right? So that's what a country decides. Now, going back to your question about the sending country, if you will. Out of Mexico. There's, um, I've heard very little, I know of very little effort by Mexico, indeed to the contrary, um, of um, limiting. But people might remember Russia as it was, you know, the Russian Jews and, you know, not being allowed to leave, right? And uh, so there are some countries, Cuba, I don't know, um, there are some countries that uh, are more explicit about, I'm not letting you leave, and it, under the UN Charter, you should be free to travel wherever you want, but then that also means that it's got to be a receiving country willing to take you. Um, not to digress too much, but one of the really interesting things about the current Snowden case and the, um, the um, major NSA wiretapping is that the U.S. revoked his passport, right? So uh, apparently uh, Ecuador uh, issued papers saying he is a refugee. I mean, this, you, you, the said receiving country needs to know, are you, do you have a right to come through my country? And um, I may not want you to stay, so how do I get you uh, out of my country into some, someplace else, right? So there's always, it's, our immigration debate is very much focused about our rules about who gets to come in. But it's true that there are these other issues about other countries deciding who gets to leave. Yeah. With the immigration quotas, do refugees figure into that? Uh, not into those quotas. There's a separate number that's established by Congress for how many refugees we take mm -hmm. as political asylum or other refugees. And economics are not a basis for uh, for refugee status. And there's, through the UN, the Western countries essentially uh, sat, ha, try to establish some uh, framework for in, where there are serious troubles and conflicts, how, ma how many people each country is going to take, right? But it's a separate number. And what happens on that front is that. There's a negotiation between the State Department and the Congress um, as to how high or low that number. And it's always kind of a little catch-22 because then you'll find the immigration judges in terms of deciding who should be granted asylum, uh, depending, maybe, uh, they're not so generous. And then, Congress will say, well, you don't need such a high number because not that you didn't use the full quota that you had last, last time. And so there's this bit of, bit of a challenge. In fact, let me just add this little piece just to give you a, a sense of just how complicated this becomes. In the 1980s, when the Central American Wars were going on, right, um, there were people fleeing El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, um, in Nicaragua to some extent. So it's very interesting sort of who left where for what reasons, but in particular El Salvador and Guatemala. And the immigration judges at that time 
just denied, 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 no political asylum, no political asylum. And finally, there were court decisions uh, saying, no, there, there are conflicts. Frankly, some of them are of our making. That's not what the decision said, but we all now know the history. Um, and yes, these people are entitled. They can show fear of persecution, show that they're in fear of life. And so then that created an opportunity for some legalization, some refugee status for the Central Americans, which then comes into play in the 1990s law, but I won't get into that. Let me, let me get back to the labor piece, unless there's another question. Um, OK, so let's, I think one of the things that we, in our immigration debate, and I've been party to a number of conversations going back over 10 years, is how rarely we acknowledge that slavery was absolutely um, a form of immigration policy totally having to do with economic needs, right? We always think of it as over here, as, as sort of not related. But what it reveals is that where, what, what capitalism, and I'm not, I'm not saying it in a negative <coughs> sense, but our market economy in, in, in an agrarian environment, in an agrarian society, at a time in which society was willing and say, this is OK, is like, I need labor. I can get it here, and I can bring it here. Right? So um, we can have our, our Declaration of Independence. We have our Constitution. Right? We, you don't find the word slavery in our Constitution. Right? There was, it was a point in which civil society, if you want, or society was going, mm, I'm, I'm. it was the big fight. Right? But we have to understand that that's part of the economic. Right? OK, so now you can't import slaves. What do we do as our economy is growing? We bring in the Chinese to help us build our railroads. And then, when we don't have any more use for them, we pass the first national, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1898. Right? We say, no more. And there's a whole uh, set of cases relating to how we treat <coughs> Japanese. What's interesting is you can pass the Chinese Exclusion Act. But when it comes to Japan, Japan was a very significant power that we often don't recognize. And so it wasn't as easy for the US to say no Japanese, but there were restrictions um, in terms of uh, being able to bring their wives, um, uh, being able to naturalize. So there's, with each um, <coughs> wave, if you uncover, if you investigate, there's an economic, there's a labor, there is something having to do with the market economy, right? So we're going from agrarian, 1860s, 1870s, industrial revolution, right? Industrial economy. Suddenly we've got factories and, you know, we've, we're booming. We need people. We just, no, with hope. I mean, what happens? Triangle shirtwaist fire, organizing. I mean, this is a very interesting, robust set of factors coming in that you can't just explain by saying, well, uh, we had open borders then. It was, um, you know, we were a more welcoming country then. No, it was economic needs, economic interests. And when you look, at uh, the history of the moves, movements for organizing and labor, and the, often the <coughs> immigrant labor being used to break strikes, right? It, 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 you start to see that there, it's a much, there's something going on with the labor piece, right? I sometimes think that part of why we aren't aware of it as much is that um, it's sort of in someone's interest to, to break that connection between immigration and labor, right? And so the debate is about they're not good enough to be, uh, to be Americans, but actually this, there are other things going on. And so what happens, going back to the 1924 law, is you have 
increasing um, radicalization and labor movements, um, unionizing, in which if you have unlimited supplies of labor, it's hard to organize. If it, right? it was just hard to organize. And so you have this, this the, and by the way, there, there are swaths of our country that are xenophobic, right? So they, they co cooperate with, with folks who are, if you will, one would say we're progressives because they believe in organizing and collective bargaining and to improving the rights of working people, actually cooperating with the xenophobic side to say, Phew, let's close the doors, right? One of my theories, which I haven't had a chance to do sufficient amount of research on, is to what degree did the rise of the middle class between 1924 and 1970 have to do with the closing of the borders? You know, union organizing, the union density increased, the middle class, you know, what, what, what happened after the 70s is a lot of people forgot who brought them the middle class. And by the way, I'm not a union apologist or totally, there are lots of issues I see in organized labor, so. That's a whole other discussion. But it's interesting to wonder how, you know, how much of the rise of the middle class, OK, we had the Depression. You def, you know, people don't realize. We're talking about, uh, I'm digressing a bit here, but we talk about uh, over <coughs> 4 million people being de uh, deported. I think that's the number. In this current cycle. Is that two um, it, in the height of the Depression, the Palmer raids, more than a million people were sent back to Mexico and even US citizens. You had a depression, right? So what do you do? You get rid of excess. If you can find a reason to push people out, you push people out, right? So the 1965 laws come in. And as I said, preference for family with a smaller percentage on uh, employment based. So there's this disconnect. Now, in that 65 law, they, uh, I need to bring to mind one of the things that happened uh, during and after World War II was the creation of the Bracero program. So, uh, yet another example of a labor need. And again, you know, you'd have to really research. Did we really need, were there in fact uh, no Americans willing to work in the fields at that time? It's possible, and, and, and the reason I think it's possible is because you have the great migration of African Americans from the south to the northern cities, right? So it, it's possible. But the design of that program uh, from 1942, and, and it was stopped in, in, as part of the 1965 law, uh, is filled with abuses. And, and uh, part of the Bracero program was there was a certain, uh, certain percentage of monies were supposed to be retained by the home country to ensure that people went back home, is it truly. Um, and then the Mexican government being the Mexican government, there are current, let, even now, litigation, some of them successful to have those monies actually given to that now 75-year-old, 80-year-old um, people who worked here. But it, it created, for agriculture in particular, now decades of dependence on foreign labor on immigrant labor in agriculture. And we can talk about agriculture specifically, uh, but it is an example. And the 65 law also created another uh, program of a temporary worker program, non-agriculture, unskilled, what is known as the H2B program, um, which uh, doesn't have a um, which has a cap on it. Um, but it is used, for example, I, when I ran the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division in the 90s, uh, I went to go visit H2B workers on the eastern shore of Maryland, crab picking. They're picking out all the meat, all Mexicans from Mexico picking. It's very hard work. It can, you can imagine to pick out all the crab meat. 
Um, there is this question of, would an employer go to the trouble of applying through the federal government to bring in foreign workers if he could, uh, if he could, it, does he really need to make that application? Or is it a question of, I can't find workers who are willing to do this job at this price? Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges is, what is really going on in the market? So those are the temporary worker programs. There's another one that many of you are probably familiar with, which is the H-1B visa for high tech. Again, these are temporary. Um, and it's been used uh, significantly by um, high-tech companies. Again, the question is, would, you, would a company, a Microsoft, go out of its way to bring in a foreign worker? Um, yeah? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, as it turns out, the major users of the H-1B program are um, standalone companies that operate very much like a labor contractor. I have computer scientists, I have high tech workers, you company need someone for a year or two, you contract with me to provide the services. So th this is, the major companies say they need more H-1B visas. It's not always clear that they're really the ones who are using them. And um, again, the evidence shows oftentimes that there will be an H-1B worker working at a, you know, a high-tech company and a regular U.S. citizen worker, and there's a difference in wages. Um, so there, so the, and that's wait, the, wait. yeah? Wait, typically if you're a, like a temporary employee, the company that contracts with the company they end up doing really well with the labor. So if there's a difference in wages, what's like the total cost of the employee? What what's the? Saying? To the employer? To the, the employer. employer. Right, exactly. I mean, you're saying that the? You say there's a difference in wages, but is the overall cost to the employer the same is what I'm, I'm asking? Typically, the overall cost to an employer depends on which employer you talk to. <coughs> Right? I mean, and I've done enforcement in this area. If, typically, the cost to the employer tends to be less. <coughs> and it's just straight economics. I mean, right? Um, so, and the important thing to know about the temporary programs, I don't care how often you say they're temporary, they're never temporary. Life happens. People fall in love. People decide they really love this country, whatever. So there are no mechanisms for people to stay after their H-1B visa unless, now I want to talk about the permanent visa. Those are the legal permanent residents who are able to stay here, work here, raise a family, eventually naturalize, eventually become a citizen. For many temporary workers, they uh, often rely on their employer to sponsor them, to, give the, to be their sponsor, because the employer has to file the application to um, the federal government to say, I need this worker for this job, and there's no other American who can do this job. And that puts the employee, <coughs> the immigrant worker, at a certain disadvantage and somewhat vulnerable. Because if you want to stay, you're less likely to go against what your employer wants. Right? So it shifts the power dynamic even more when people decide they want to stay. On the permanent program, because there is a cap, um, it's, it, it is an arduous process, very difficult to, uh, to uh, apply. Essentially, the person's already working for the employer, but then has to go through a lot of hoops to establish that there is, in fact, no other 
American who <coughs> knows these four languages, has this level of education, has this set of skills that, you know, then it's like tailor-made. And there's a whole industry. There are lawyers out there who specialize in writing the job description so that, in fact, there's really only one person who can take this job. <laughs> so the, the, we have this imbalance. Now, 70s, 80s, yes, we had a recession. We had high energy costs. But there's a transformation going on in our economy. And one of the consequences of the night between 1965 <coughs> to 1980 was there started to be a growing undocumented population. All those temporary workers whose employer didn't come through with them, for them with a permanent visa, they're staying. All those people coming in on, on student visas deciding they or tourist visas deciding they want to stay here. By the way, 50% of those who are here undocumented did come in legally. They came in with a visa that just expired, right? Which is, drives me crazy about this border security stuff. Uh, but, and then those lines that have been built up in sending countries like Mexico, people got tired of waiting. They come across, right? So the 1986 law. And what's really interesting about the 1986 law uh, was up until then, um, employers had fought very much to prevent any kind of sanction against employers hiring undocumented. So you can penalize the immigrant for being here illegally, but actually um, penalizing the employer for hiring an undocumented was not uh, the law until 1986. Indeed, there was a law passed in the 50s that had the Texas loophole, and which was essentially, yeah, <laughs> which was essentially, uh, it would be uh, a violation if you harbored or uh, aided and undocumented, but they made sure that harbor does not include employment. <laughs> so, so to me, it's just like the hypocrisy. I mean, it's just blatant, right? It's like, well, I want these workers, I'm going to get them any way I can, and I don't want to be responsible. But uh, 1986, the quid pro quo was, OK, we've got almost 4 million people who are here undocumented. We have to strengthen the border. But we also have to penalize employers. And we got, for the first time, um, an organized labor wanted employer sanctions. Right? Let's penalize the employer. Um, and the problem is, we really did not draft that law for it to be implemented. Two things happened. One is a huge debate about a national ID card, right? If you really want to verify <coughs> and not, uh, that someone is entitled to work in this country, and you really profess that you don't want to discriminate on the basis of national origin, race, language, everybody should carry an ID and be asked for it. But instead, what came out of 86 was you have either a valid US passport or a birth certificate and ID that shows that you are you, or a set of other documents, any three or four of which will prove who you are and that you are legally entitled to be here. As Doris Meisner, former head of the then INS, said, it created a huge market for fraudulent documents. <laughs> Duh, social security card and something. Go down to MacArthur Park in LA. <laughs> so, um, and then, so it was like, okay, we didn't want a national ID card because we just don't, we're, we're not. Every other country has a national ID card, but not us. Um, the second thing that happened was we divided responsibility for enforcing this law between wage and hour. You know, I was sort of passionate because I actually had to listen to my investigators. Like, they were already have the authority to go visit an employer, check wait, payroll, hours, overtime. So have them check the I-9s. Because every time you get employed, you can't check, ask for a proof that you're eligible to work until you've been hired. And then you have to fill out the form and fill out. And then the employer has to hold on to these forms. 
and wait an hour, <laughs> invest, it investigated, would review and determine, well, you've got 10 form here and you have 20 people. Or the forms you have here don't, but wage an hour, who otherwise is perfectly able to assess penalties and bring enforcement, in this case, had to refer the case to the then INS, to the enforcement, who then would, under, would undertake their own investigation, which, because the premium for the INS on the enforcement side is how many people did you catch and how many people have you deported, they might get referrals for, you know, hundreds of cases and maybe investigate five. So it was designed to fail. I think it was, you know, a wink, wink and a nod. We're going to give you employer sanctions, but it's not. Okay, what does that have to do with today? Well, a couple of things. The quid pro quo in 86 was amnesty. Right? That's the word that was used. People were able, if they proved they'd been in the country before a certain date, um, they could apply for legal permanent residency and ultimately um, naturalization if they wanted. Uh, because of the failure of the employer sanctions, now, because 11 million people undocumented, so it's you know, almost three times the problem we had in the 80s. Right? Why? Because we didn't really look at or, or fix the underlying disconnect between our employment needs and our, immigra and our immigration policy. We stuck to the family piece, you know. So, yeah. So from uh, how many millions in the... Uh, About four million, a little under four million in 86. And, and we ended up with 11. 11 now, and that's only, yeah. So are we saying that they were, they were new immigrants? Big chunk. Or people who came in after the cutoff day in 86. Yeah. Question? So the issues, the issues in our current debate is about employment. I'll give you one example. In, in the Senate bill, the issue is a temporary worker program. You know, what kind of program do we design to deal with our labor needs? And there's a part of Congress that wants, really believes in a temporary worker program. and want people to come here and work and then leave. That is treating human beings as, exactly, it's just a sort of, you are only a worker and nothing else to me, right? We have no experience anywhere, and neither does Germany, by the way, no temporary worker program works anywhere. You know, unless you're in Saudi Arabia or some of the Mideastern countries where they can really just, <coughs> really, it's pretty dire there. But, you know, Germany was rebuilt with Turks and the thinking was, okay, they'll come here to work and then they'll go home. No. <laughs> Their kids grow up speaking German, not Turkish. You know, it just it doesn't work. Okay, so progressives or those on, on a more liberal <coughs> side concede that there there is this need for more worker accommodation, um, and um, have argued that those f what we call America the future American <coughs> worker programs really need to have built in some process for those people who decide they want to stay that they can decide that they can apply. And you can set it, you can make it whatever it is, but it has to be within the employee's right, not the employer, because that gives the employer too much power. I can hold out for 20 years and make you basically my slave, essentially, pay you, but you're never getting your green card, right? Um, and so the design of that <coughs> future worker program is hugely important because Based on what we learned from the Bracero program and also the experience over the last um, <coughs> decades on the H2B, H1B, uh, and the agriculture worker program, unless you provide mechanisms for people if they decide to stay. And oh, by the way, there are a lot of people who actually do want to go home. I haven't met a single immigrant, cab driver, or anyone else. I do this every time I talk to anyone. It's like, I'm going to work here and then I'm going to go home, right? 
And I always jokingly say that my parents are the perfect example. My dad, parents came in as braceros. They worked, an employer sponsored them. My dad asked for a raise. The employer said no. And so he moved to California, thank God. Otherwise, I'd be in Texas. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but my dad actually went back after 40 years, left us. But, uh, but, you know, but there is a chunk of people, frankly, who would want to go back, right? But it has to be their decision. And, and how you manage, uh, if you treat people just as the, if they're only workers, it really, you're not going to be solving all of this set of issues, right? So part of the deal in the Senate is they put a special provision for construction workers. We can, 15,000 can come in as temporary workers in construction. The Republican House has said, that's too low. Now, I don't know about you, but I recall a time when being a construction worker, oops, a construction worker was a good job, right? Something's going on. Well, employers want a different workforce, less susceptible to unionization. Watch, watch how that gets decided. That's one piece. Thanks. Sorry. I got too excited. Speaking <laughs> with my hands. Um, the, and then the terms of the amnesty, so-called amnesty or legalization. It's becoming, as you listen to that debate, it's a continuation of we want people to stay to work and then leave. And now for <laughs> um, legalization, it's we'll let you stay, but we don't ever want you to become a citizen, right? So and by the way, based on yesterday's vote, we're going to spend more money to secure the border. Now. The thing about um, worker programs, when you look across the globe uh, to other countries, where Italy has a negative birth rate, right? I mean, if you look at Western countries, what happens is more educated, less children. Um, Part of what has helped this country sustain its economic, even in these times, but particularly in the 90s, was there was immigrants. Um, and so there is this need for, for workers, for labor. But my problem with um, expansion of a uh, temporary worker program for unskilled is the following. <coughs> We're bringing folks in with um, basic levels of education or little education to do essentially work that uh, apparently Americans don't want. But we're doing a pretty good job of growing our own unskilled, uneducated workforce. OK? So tell me why, as a matter of policy, we would choose to bring in more people. And it makes me think of that gap between 1924 and 1965, right? What if we really tried to make sure that only people who were authorized to work here did work here? Um, and oh, by the way, those manufacturing jobs that led to the greatest economic boom, they were scut jobs. They were bad jobs until, right, until unionization. OK, we have more service sector jobs. Nothing says that service sector jobs should be low wage, low, you know, low benefits. Uh, but if you've always got more people coming in, it's going to be very hard to unionize, which is why labor has been such a key voice this time around <laughs> in legalization. They understand that their future workforce, whether it's SEIU or um, uh, uh, unite here, that these people need to be able to, to be, have legal status in order to be able to assert their rights. So what, do you, what do you think is the relationship between the changing electorate and immigration policy? Um, I think there is a direct connection. 
I think uh, uh, that's a whole nother <laughs> discussion. On, I do a lot of work on civic engagement. Um, the thing about immigration policy is uh, it, it is about votes, but um, and it's got people who have ambitions for statewide or nationwide office, really anxious to try to cut a deal. But if you're a House member in particular, uh, you're more worried, a House Republican member, you're more worried about um, a challenger from your right. For, uh, mm -hmm. And so you're less, and you probably don't have that, the way districts are drawn, you probably don't have that different or that demographic sufficient demographics to make to have an impact and so you you're more worried about that you're a challenge on the right but I think overall there's no question and, and people worked really hard to try to make sure that the story the day after the election in 2012 uh, was Latinos were key and you know and it isn't just Latinos there's a lot of Asians there are a lot of Southeast Asians Africans <coughs> Caribbeans um, but um, so let me finish up with the uh, so our current debate. The other debate is the um, ID, the employee employer verification, the employee verification system. Now, what happens between 1986 and today, 2013, is technology. It is a lot easier to verify that you are who you are and that you have a right to be here. And um, whether, I mean, a, a lot of employers will say, yeah, we, we want to obey, we want to hire a legal workforce, thank you. We want to hire a legal workforce, but we can't tell who's legal because of all those fraudulent documents. And oh, by the way, I don't want to discriminate, and so I, I don't want to just pick out who I think might be foreign. Um, well, now you can actually design um, a, a a tamper-proof ID, even if people talk about biometrics, right? And the question is, can, can you actually implement a system where only people who are authorized to work here can work here? Now, my friends on the left really hate <coughs> employee verification, right? I'm in a minority because I actually think, because of my concern about the US workforce, We've never actually tried, except for that period between 1924 and 1965, we've never actually tried to, what happens if you have control of your workforce and only people who are authorized to work here can work here? Might it create pressures and demands and improve conditions so that service like janitorial, restaurant, you know, a ton of other home health care workers are actually good middle class jobs. We don't know, right? Um, and my friends on the left will say, well, it's just going to drive people further underground, right? And my response to that is, first off, no matter what you do on immigration, when you need to understand, you can never stop, ever have 100% control of that friggin' border or any, you cannot stop the human spirit. And you, we've been moving from the beginning. And think about it. Think about the people who are willing to put themselves in the hold of a ship, the Golden Hind or whatever it was called, off, that washed ashore off of Long Island in the early 90s, you know, all the way from China, a hole in the ship, in a container, crossing the desert, making their way from, uh, you Spain and Morocco, Spain's got a big issue. They've been doing the same thing we've been doing. They've been trying to build up the border and really make it impossible for people to come in from Northern Africa. People are going to come, right? So I think the best we can do is try to, to have a more honest discussion about what, what's going on here, right? Are there really jobs that no American will take? Do, I think there probably are. You know, how do we decide if there is a, a real labor shortage or not? I, I still can't believe the construction worker, right? But I remember getting a call from workers in New Orleans that had come in as H2B as pipe welders from <coughs> India. Excuse me? I thought pipe welding was, you know, used to be an okay job. 
This, and you can't find any Americans willing to be pipe welders? I'm sorry. Um, so, so this is how this debate, all we can really do is try to manage the size of the problem. And if we try an employee verification system, ideally I'd like a system that was neutral, universal, non-discriminatory, accurate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, and one idea my husband and I, when we talk about these issues, was, well, what if, what if you were an employer? You know, you're a, you run a business, and if you run a business, you deduct what you pay as wages. That's part of your employ, employer expense. These are about um, probably would affect about 17, 18 million people. So, if we really wanted to, we could address some of these problems. Um, so we want to reduce the size of the undocumented, uh, understanding that it's never going to completely go away. But we also need to be thinking, what oddly, you know, on the H1B side, what are we doing in terms of STEM education? You know, why aren't we growing our own? If India decided to put us, you know, they wanted to be the engineers uh, for the world, and they do have over a billion people, so they could say, I'm going to do this for 100 million, why couldn't we decide? We're, you know, so there are a set of labor issues that are totally part of this immigration debate. And, um, and yet I think that it's too simplistic to, to, to view it as simply um, we don't want more people coming in um, uh, or uh, they're, they're not learning English. That's another myth. <coughs> right? Marco Rubio said you have to be proficient in English in order to be uh, a citizen. Um, the, the reality is uh, by the third generation, only 5% of, um, of sp Spanish origin Hispanics are fully bilingual by the third generation. So like, no, everyone's learning English. So let me stop there. On that happy note. <laughs> uh, could you talk just for a minute about the relationship between the United States and Mexico and some of the difficulties <coughs> in Mexico as a result? Okay. And tagging along with that, how NAFTA affected migration? Uh, there is, uh, first off, let's, the US Mexico relationship is one that uh, if I were a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> Don't you think it's interesting? Oh, yeah, let me just back up a little bit. <laughs> so you have Mexico that, if anybody, it's a very rich country, has a lot of natural resources. Here's the data point. Uh, 40 years ago, the US had the highest percentage of high school graduates. Uh, and it was a survey of about 40 countries. Down at the bottom were South Korea and Mexico. Hmm? Today, and the last number I think I saw was 2009, 2010. South Korea is number one in high school graduates at like 97, you know, huge percentage. The US is at 13. Mexico's still down at 39. It moved one percentage point in 40 years. Now, isn't that interesting that you have this big, rich country to the north, and here is this uneducated, unskilled workforce right next door. I mean, you, I'm not a conspiracy <coughs> theorist, but boy, is that convenient. Like, who benefits? Who benefits, right? It's more complicated than that. Mexico, its, it's political structure, its governance, its um, lack of accountability, very weak civil society. Um, it is a relationship that uh, benefited <coughs> the oligarchy of Mexico. And a big chunk of the employer community in the US, right? Um, but it's reached a point in which the drug violence is making it very difficult for the oligarchs <coughs> to continue making money in Mexico. So there is this opportunity, I think, for, uh, for change in Mexico, uh, which is really our problem, right? If Mex most people want to stay home if they had opportunity. And NAFTA it had an impact on both Mexico and Central America in terms of um, 
freeing up and the focus on trade of particularly corn. Um, and that really made it difficult for small farmers to compete. Or my dad, that dad who went home. OK, so he's up. He became a rancher and had pigs, pork, and cattle. And he was like, forget raising pigs. And he loves his pigs. He loves taking care of them. He says, it's not worth it. I grow, but they import the pork from the US. I can't make any money. I can't survive on this. And that's just one little example. So it absolutely had an impact that, again, um, you, you wonder why these issues aren't more fully explored. Now, the problem, I think, on the NAFTA and trade is that the knee-jerk reaction is to say no to trade, right? I'm in the school that actually trade helps us. You know, If you are doing business with people, you are less likely to go to war. You are less likely to have conflict. But we've got to find ways in which you make trade, uh, you know, including environmental protections and labor protections. It's got to include more than just um, the the flow of capital and goods. Um, we're a long way from that. Think about it. The international labor organization <coughs> seeking, trying to have a floor of working conditions around the globe. And yet we have a World Trade Organization that absolutely makes sure that there are rules and systems for trade, right? We can't do that with labor. Something's, something's not quite right. Question? Anyone? Yeah. Just, just go, to go back to NAFTA for a few minutes, you said that the, the undocumented worker population was 4 million in 1986, and now it's 11 million, uh, or estimated. Didn't NAFTA really have a lot to do with that in bankrupting all those southern farmers in Mexico? It was a piece of it, a piece of it. It was also, look, let's talk about agriculture. Um, yeah, there's a piece of it. That has to do with it. But I also think that there, there is, um, these people came and there were jobs for him here, here, right? So why were there jobs? Setting aside agriculture, why is construction suddenly very interested in having a worker force from outside the country? That's just, that, that's just crazy, right? You know, why, you know, home health care workers. Um, oh, I didn't even mention, we used to have a nurses program, visas. I don't know how many of you, there was a time in which every nurse was Filipino, right? Yeah. Now, part of it was Rockefeller Foundation set up a nursing school, part of economic development. We don't have enough nursing schools here. We don't have enough nurse practitioners. We're about to add 40 million people to actually have access to health care. Now, understand, mm -hmm. they have access to health care except it's through the emergency room, right? Now, if we get the implementation of the Affordable Care Act with all of its complexities, but nonetheless, the demand for primary care is gonna go off the roof, right? Um, that we have a bill being debated right now in Sacramento about scope of practice as to whether you know, nurse practitioners or how many doctors can, the, you know, how many doctors you need to supervise nurse practitioners. Um, uh, opposition by medical doctors. So there's, there are other forces in play in terms of, I guess I always want is like who benefits, right? If you keep a market closed, if you limit access, who benefits from that? Um, and so it's not, not just NAFTA. It's a piece of it. There's this like, a stereotype or idea that most of the people whose visas are expired are, or here illegally are Latino. Is that accurate? No. Oh. No, no. That's what I love. You know, this is this big fight. That's the other big fight. You know, we got to make the 11 million wait at the back of the line in order to get legalized because there have been people waiting patiently in line. And you really hear this shows a little of the fractures and the coalitions between the Southeast Asian, you know, Indian, et cetera. It's like, yeah, we've been waiting. You know, we did it legally. It's like, yeah, if India was south of the border, you tell me how long they'd wait in line. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, oh, so it turns out who, who gets to come from India, China, and uh, these other countries? 
well educated, yes. who can apply and show I got I'm a tourist or I'm coming in. Yeah, because that's you know, it's a big ocean and like it's really hard to get here. And then who comes from nowadays? Even people who are educated, um, you know, professionals in Mexico and other places come. But there is a real move, and I'm more familiar with Mexico. There is a real um, burgeoning, um, <coughs> nascent uh, civil society movement going on, where people are like, "No, we need, we, we, this country ought to be able to provide opportunity for its citizens." Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I saw. I feel like that. Uh, there's so many forces pushing first uh, the population that uh, decide to cross, for example, in one or another way, and then say. So um, the, it seems like uh, definitely the issue is in both sides. If you want to see that Mexico is the big biggest uh, sender, and um, so there has been. Um, is there some evidence during this history of the immigration? Um, that um, some kind of efforts trying to to see the situation not just and in one pole but the two poles because in those countries, for example, that is uh, uh, expelling people, there's um, breaks on the models, economical models, and that's why the, uh, probably one of the first issue that is happening. And obviously wars in other situations, but economic. These situations have been or, or some kind of um, possibilities of someone, not necessarily the governments, but uh, some well, I kind of efforts. I think that uh, not as much. And I think you can't quite ignore, I'll close with this. Uh, you can't quite ignore the role of culture. And, I, and I say that as uh, someone who spent a lot of time in Mexico and Americans, for all of our flaws, uh, we have some sense, even folks who don't have college degrees, we have some sense that we have a right to speak out. It's really pretty astonishing. We're organization. There, there are more organizations. Mean, Americans love to organize. If there's an issue, they, there's some group. <laughs> And, and they're willing to petition. They're willing to, right? Other cultures, and I speak of, of Mexico, having spent a lot of time in this little village, it's just like, there's not a sense that you can speak out. It's like, why bother? No one's going to, you know, it's just a real sense of, of I don't have a right to demand. And not even a sense of, uh, the, the example I have is, Speaking to my cousin, we're complaining about how this little town is not the way, little town it used to be, and there's this bar, and it stays open all night, and they give alcohol to 14-year-old, and this is really bad. And I said to my cousin, "Well, why don't it, why don't a group of you, you know, get the priest? The priest is really smart. Get the, go and visit. The, it's okay for you to make money, but let's have some rules, like no alcohol. It was like it was just like no, I, yeah." A sense, maybe, that so there's a more civil society, more that needs to be done, and there are people working on that, definitely working on that. Uh, this just rings a bell with my, uh, the small town where my family's from in Mexico. There's a highway that runs right through it, and then a lot of children have been killed, in the, uh, and there, no one has ever said anything, I and mean, there's all these deaths that happen continuously. No one's, they've been afraid to say, you know, no more, we need to widen the roads, uh, or, or nothing has been done. And yeah, it's, it's just there's just is that, yeah. It's also uh, that part of um, Mexico, and not just Mexico, it's everywhere. <clears throat> In those countries, that uh, there's corruption. Right, so, exactly. Uh, corruption yeah. is, is also, you know, people not in, uh, mobilizing towards some goals. I think it's also right, part right, of right. The how, how that been happening, that there's mobilization, I think. And, but it's, the mobilization is not enough because it's, you know, there's also institution yeah. um, analyzed. Um, yes, no, there is definitely corruption. And there's corruption in this country, too. Yeah. But we do find it, it, there's some effort to expose it, to prosecute it, and it, you know. Last question. Um, last Tuesday, there was a, an event on Marina Green in San Francisco. The nuns on the bus had a tour that started on Ellis Island and finished 
Tracy oh. Angel Island, promoting better immigration legislation. The one, they had a lot of speakers, but the most moving speaker was Tim Paulson, the head of the San Francisco Labor Council, who really spoke out about you know, the need for better legislation protecting immigrant labor half the citizenship. Are there other labor leaders oh, yes. talking that they are? Yes, absolutely. It's it's a it it is a broad and, and as I said, labor instead of saying no, labor said uh, as they labor was um, you know, an unwilling partner in eighty six, but the was employer sanctions. This time it was like we need legalization because they know that, I mean the art organized labor is in a world of hurt. Mm -hmm. Right? So uh, they understand. So, yeah, they're definitely speaking. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.